I don't get that many requests to talk about certain games, but of what I got, they've mostly been about Crash Bandicoot. Well, to those of you who asked for it, the wait is finally over. And what a perfect time to do it, since we're currently in the year of his 20th anniversary. And I'm not sure if Sony has anything planned, probably not, I, mean, I don't know, this upcoming E3, but I certainly have something planned. I love Crash Bandicoot. I hold him so nearly and dearly to my heart, and even though he's pretty much been laying dormant since 2008, I still love revisiting those classic adventures. So, for the month of June, I'm going to be dedicating a couple of my videos to the orange marsupial himself. Hey, look at that, I'm wearing, I'm wearing orange, so appropriate. <laughs> and don't worry, this won't be as extensive as the Mario Marathon, I won't be covering every game in the series. Instead, I'm only going to be talking about the first three Crash games blah, 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 released for the PlayStation. So, for those of you who wanted me to talk about games like Wrath of Cortex, uh, Crash Twin Sanity, Crash of the Titans, or Mind Over Mutant, then sorry, but not right now. Okay, I think I've gone on long enough. Let's dive right into the first game, the one that started it all. Once upon a time, there were two kids named Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin. Back in 1984, they founded their own game company called Jam Software, which five years later was renamed to Naughty Dog. That's right, Naughty Dog. As in the same Naughty Dog that gave us Uncharted, Jack and Daxter, and The Last of Us. I'm sure you didn't know that. Oh, you did? Oh. Moving on. After Naughty Dog made Way of the Warrior for Universal Interactive Studios, Vice President Mark Cerny signed them on to produce three more games for the company. Andy and Jason then decided to make a 3D action platform game, and gave it to Sony Computer Entertainment for them to publish on the console that would bring them into the gaming industry. The legendary PlayStation. Oh, so many good games! And I have to bring this up because I'm sure somebody's going to in the comments. Because the game was focused on an animal, and the camera was pointed at his rear, Naughty Dog jokingly referred to it as Sonic's Ass Game. That is the greatest name for any game I've ever heard. But it kinda made sense for Naughty Dog to do this with Sony, because Nintendo had Mario, Sega had Sonic, even Accolade had Bubsy the Bobcat. And by the way, I will never talk about that thing. So this kinda left Sony without a mascot of their own. And we all know what happened after that. This. That's what. Crash Bandicoot, the star of his own game which came out on September 9th, 1996. I didn't have any Sony consoles growing up, so the only way I was able to play the original Crash Bandicoot games was by going to my cousin's house. They had the original trilogy and a PS2 for me to play them on, but since then I only remember very specific moments from each game. The first level of Crash 1, a cutscene from Crash 2, and the title screen of Crash 3. And thanks to YouTubers like Some Call Me Johnny and especially Cat Icarus, my interest in the Crash Bandicoot series has skyrocketed. So much so that I bought the original trilogy and a PS1 just to play them on. But the real question remains, how does the Bandicoot's first adventure hold up 20 years later? And what the heck is a Bandicoot anyway? And why would you tease us with that scene in Uncharted 4, Naughty Dog? That's just messed up! Okay, okay, in the words of Maz Kanata, good questions for another time. Crash Bandicoot is a failed lab experiment who escapes from the clutches of the evil Dr. Neo Cortex and his henchman N. Brio. Cortex wants to make an army of enhanced animals to take over the world, which actually sounds kind of familiar somehow, but I digress. Crash's girlfriend Tana, some sick furry's dream come true, is next in line to get her brains tickled by Cortex's magic lasers, and now it's up to Crash to save her. This doesn't really mean anything, because when you rescue Tana in the end, she seems just fine. So did Cortex get distracted at some point? Was he hungry and just remembered to do something evil after coming back from his apparently long lunch break? Is he just slow? Should I really bother questioning the plot to a Crash Bandicoot game? Or any game for that matter, because I said before that I don't care about stories in video games? I'm kinda dumb. So, for a 3D game from the early days of 3D games, how does Crash Bandicoot play? Well, basically, the developers took 2D side-scrollers like Donkey Kong Country and switched the angles around. And in terms of gameplay and structure, it's pretty standard. The level design is very linear, you have a grand total of two buttons, one for jumping and one for attacking, and you collect 100 pieces of Wumpa Fruit to get an extra life. Now, lots of people have compared this game to another 3D platformer that came out at that time, that being Super Mario 64. 
And I don't know if that's exactly a fair comparison to make, because Mario 64 pretty much set the standards for how every 3D platforming game should be made. But Crash doesn't exactly follow those rules, so it probably isn't fair to compare it to Mario 64. When I say Crash doesn't follow the rules, that's not really a bad thing, because it's clear that it tries to be its own thing. Again, it's basically a 2D side-scroller, but with the camera pointed behind you. This hallway style of platforming is one of the many things that I think makes Crash Bandicoot so unique. That and the health system. Like a plumber without his mushrooms and a hedgehog without his... rings, Crash is incredibly vulnerable. Because of this, he'll need to rely on a tiki mask that goes by the name Aku Aku. Aku Aku pretty much lets you take an extra hit from enemies. Collecting another mask while you already have one will let you take two extra hits. And collecting a third mask will make you invincible for a short time while a catchy little bongo loop plays. Somebody please make a gif out of this. Aku Aku can be found by smashing crates with his face on them. Crates are all over the place, not just having Aku Aku inside, but also Wumpa Fruit and extra lives. Sometimes you can even come across emblems of your girlfriend, Tana. Collecting all three sends you to a bonus room where you have to destroy even more crates. And even though Crash doesn't have the best endurance- Wait, wait, what the- how did that kill me? I wasn't anywhere near it! Ahem. <clears throat> Anyway, even though Crash doesn't have the best endurance, he's pretty versatile. With the simple press of a button, Crash can perform a spin attack. Spinning into enemies can knock him far across the screen, and it's extremely satisfying to do. Either that or just jumping on them the old-fashioned way. I enjoy doing both, but sometimes the collision detection doesn't always seem to be on my side. I can never tell when I'm going to kill an enemy or not using the spin, and if it doesn't work, I'll just end up getting myself killed. Sometimes I can even die because of how Crash handles. I don't really have a problem with the controls, they work fine, notwithstanding the lack of analog control, which even then isn't a huge issue. Crash himself just feels a little heavy, especially when making jumps. I also find him to be a bit persnickety when it comes to precise platforming, because his traction is very slippery. Oh, ooh, well, that was embarrassing. Oh, and that, that too. Okay. Other times during my playthrough, deaths would occur because of how most of these levels are designed. Whether it's me trying to fight this game's admittedly poor depth perception, then again, a lot of early PS1 games have this problem, or if it's the level itself that's testing your platforming skills. And when I say it tests you, I mean it really tests you. I'm going to look you in the eyes and tell you this now. Crash Bandicoot is hard for so many different reasons. You have pretty eyes. I recall going through a similar thing with Yoshi's Island. The first few levels started out fine, but when I got farther, it started throwing just a bit too much at me, specifically when I got to the Lost City. Or was it Sunset Vista? Yeah, that's another thing about this game. A lot of levels look nearly identical. I know they all take place in a jungle, but I've seen tons of levels reuse the same gimmicks and aesthetics. The High Road looks exactly like the Road to Nowhere, Jaws of Darkness looks exactly like the Temple Ruins, both the Boulder levels look the same. It's not really a huge issue, but it can be distracting. The most difficult thing about Crash Bandicoot, without a shred of doubt, is trying to complete it 100%. And I know what you're thinking, isn't going for 100% the hardest thing about any game? Well, yeah, but <laughs> wait until you hear this. In order to get 100% in this game, you'll need to break every box in every stage, which in turn rewards you with that stage's gem. Sounds simple, right? Well, it's not! It's not! First off, you won't be able to break every box in specific stages without collecting gems from other stages. Once you grab a certain gem, a corresponding gem platform will appear in another stage, and here you can grab those boxes you missed. So there's a lot of backtracking involved, which in itself is already a chore. Second, you can't die. I mean, you can, but if you want to go for 100%, then don't do it. Why? Because when you die, all the boxes you broke reappear again. Even when you break the checkpoint box, which saves everything you did up to that point, except break any boxes you broke before that. Even when you go back to break all the boxes that reappear, and then break every other box in the level, you won't get the gem and just go back to the world map. All because of those one or few times you died. Third, collecting gems and beating the bonus room that I briefly mentioned before are the only ways you can save your progress. They even made saving the game hard! So even to do something as basic as saving your progress, you have to break every box in a stage without dying and collect that stage's gem, 
or go through the bonus stage and break the boxes there without dying. So if you want to leave the game and come back to it later, you'll have an easier time using the game's password system. Speaking of which, the only way I was able to show every level in secret in the game was by using a super password that gives you all the levels and collectibles from the beginning. I've never completed this game 100%, nor do I plan to. That's it! I need a minute! Get over here, Comfort Penguin. Get over here. Oh, Comfort Penguin. Nobody understands me like you do. I guess the last thing to talk about are the boss battles. I don't really have much to say, honestly. They're just kind of there. Papu Papu's nothing special. Whoa, look at Crash's mouth. Ripperoo can be a little annoying with these TNT crates. By the way, TNT crates are bad. Koala Kong's kind of annoying, I guess. Pinstripe Potteroo's all right. And Brio's a lot easier than I remember. Even the final boss against Cortex isn't anything special. None of them are terrible, but I guess they lack a little bit of spectacle. But before we get to Cortex, we have to go through the Great Hall. Okay, there's a bunch of gems here, and... Hey, it's my girlfriend! Uh, wait, did, did I just beat the game? Are you telling me that I can rescue Tana without having to beat the final boss? That's kind of amazing, actually. And look, you even get little epilogues for each of the bosses. After intense therapy and eight years of higher education, Dr. Rue went on to write the well-received book, through the Eye of the Vortex, a study of rapid evolution and its consequences. Funny, he doesn't seem that different when we see him in Crash Team Racing, unless he went through some kind of breakdown off-screen in between games. After the disappearance of his mentor, Dr. Nitrous Brio rediscovered his first love, tending bar. I'm pretty sure the only bar he'd ever be allowed to tend is Club Techno Chocolate. They've sold more dangerous concoctions than his, he'd fit right in! P.S. I expect your Homestar Runner Crash Bandicoot fan art on my desk by five. I'm making it canon, you make it canon too. <sighs> Alright, after all that... stuff, you're probably really curious. What's my verdict on Crash Bandicoot? Well, <laughs> I haven't said what's my verdict in a while. Uh, well, overall, I think the quality of the game can really only be determined by how you play it. Looking back, Crash Bandicoot reminds me a lot of Undertale. Now hear me out, the way you play Undertale, whether it be the pacifist run or the genocide run, can pretty much determine your overall opinion on it. And Crash Bandicoot is the same thing. If you play it normally without trying to get the collectibles, you'll probably have a good time with it. But if you try going for 100% completion, it could be one of the most frustrating experiences you'll ever have with a video game. From my experience with it, there are definitely things about it that frustrated me, and in all honesty, I don't think the game has aged very well. Sometimes it's a bit too hard for casual players to enjoy it, and other elements like the save feature come off as a bit archaic. But at the same time, it has this sort of fascinating charm to it, that kind of charm you see in a lot of old games. There's something about the music and the graphics, which are both great, I must say. In fact, the music is probably the most consistently good thing about this game. It's not really catchy, except for the Insanity Beach theme, but it's atmospheric, and each piece fits the world they play in pretty much perfectly. Graphically, it's really well done, but sometimes I come across some funny little things here and there. Like, look at this. Crash is standing on the mountain. It's it's Crashzilla! In the end, the first Crash Bandicoot doesn't hold up too well nowadays, but back then it was pretty ambitious. It was a game for a new console featuring a new character, and it ended up being very successful. Crash Bandicoot wasn't just another cheap attempt at trying to create a mascot for a company. He was a true icon that helped make the PlayStation brand so popular in its early beginnings. And that's something we should definitely appreciate him for. The first Crash Bandicoot game was a big hit when it first came out. So much so that Naughty Dog tried their hand at a sequel just an entire year later. Will it prove to be one of the great game sequels? Or will it put a stop to the Bandicoot's time in the spotlight? Find out next time with my review of Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back. With that said, this is Mark, aka You Know Who, bidding you all a you-know-what.